Welcome to the uh, symposium on progress and, pro and uh, promise in prostate cancer. Our sponsors uh, here, their supporters are uh, Bayer, Dendrion, Endo Pharmaceuticals, and Janssen, who have generously allowed us to, to uh, create this presentation at the end of a very inspiring two days conference sponsored by the Society for Trans Translational Oncology. I'd like to begin by uh, asking all three panelists to contribute to this question, but maybe we can start with Johan, and that is, and I'm sure you can anticipate this, it seems like the, in targeted therapy, the progress that we've made has come through understanding the molecular subtypes of disease that, and the drivers of those subtypes of disease. You've alluded to that in prostate cancer. In fact, you showed us a slide with 22 different molecular subtypes. But that's a little complicated. Do you think it's gonna, gonna be that complicated or is it gonna be something relatively simple uh, like mutations involving the PI3 kinase pathway versus uh, RAS, RAF, MAP kinase, MEC, and so forth? Uh, it, it seems like it's a very important question in, in taking the next step toward uh, selective therapy. So what, is, what are your thoughts about that, Johan? With regards to uh, our dream of actually eventually treating men with prostate cancer without castrating them, which must be our ultimate goal, and curing them of cancer, I think we will have to focus on, for example, drugs targeting ERG or ERG signaling. So that will require, or maybe ETV1, 10% of prostate cancers, that will generally require truly molecularly characterized disease. Are those However, druggable targets? There is emerging evidence that one can drug, for example, ERG by inhibiting PARP. There was a paper published by the Chinian group in Cancer Cell in May, for which I wrote the editorial, where they showed that PARP directly interacts with ERG and is a key transcriptional modulator of ERG. In fact, PARP is a transcriptional modulator for maybe many uh, targets, um, many transcription factors, including maybe the AR. But if I back off somewhat from that vision, which maybe is the longer term vision, the, inc the increasing evidence biologically is that actually prostate cancer may be at least in part uh, induced by androgens. And androgens may in fact be carcinogens indirectly by binding AR, AR actually binding to AR uh, response elements, binding sites, inducing double strand breaks to topwise raised to beta, which are normally actually re-annealed in a normal fashion. Mm -hmm. But actually what is emerging is that actually in some cases where perhaps there may be um, inadequate repair or an underlying DNA repair defect, perhaps through loss of NKX 3.1, you actually emerge with, at that, re at that response element, AR response element, a, a DNA double strand break, non-homologous end non joining, and perhaps through a stochastic process, rearrangements of you know, a AR-driven promoter to the oncogene like ERG. And that data has come from multiple groups, particularly um, the Hopkins group. Um, and I think the evidence for that is really quite strong. You can now induce rearrangements, ERG rearrangements in cell lines that are ERG negative, just by high dose androgen and radiation therapy. And what is apparent is that actually loss of homologous recombination repair but proficient, low fidelity, non-homologous end joining is key to accelerating that process. Generating the, the downstream mutations. Yes, so I, so I think in that setting where androgen, you know, androgens are causing rearrangements that are androgen receptor driven, perhaps hormonal therapies will not require the more broad, you know, or the, you know, the patient selection and that's why abiraterone works so well, both in the rearranged, erg rearranged and unrearranged patients. But I think if we truly want to get down to hitting some of those key drivers, I think we will have to select patients. Do more detailed molecular studies. Yeah. Any comments from the other speakers about this? Yep. Do you see the possibility of stratification, yep. for example, for the radionuclide therapy? Well, I think that, you know, having listened to the speakers over the last two days, prostate cancer is well behind <laughs> breast cancer, colon cancer, 
hematological malignancy in the stratification in, in that yeah. in the genetic stratification. But speaking as somebody who's, you know, anybody who works with these patients in the clinic will see a huge variety of, of, of disease presentations and disease progressions. So I think the, the prostate cancer phenotype is very heterogeneous. Yes. Like we see patients who don't need treatment at all, right up to patients who are rap with rapidly fatal disease. We see huge variety of responses to both antigen deprivation, anti-antigen therapy, to, to cytotoxic chemotherapy. And I think the same is true for radionuclide therapy. So I think the, it's very obvious that there's a very wide variety of phenotypes. Mm -hmm. So I think the next step is to start and probably repair capability. Yeah. So that would certainly influence the radionuclide sure. uh, response. And well, we just haven't used that in selecting patients or, or trying to organize studies. Any thoughts? Yes, I David? think the only other thing that I would say is that despite that molecular heterogeneity, there may be functional pathways that are um, common to some of those molecular phenotypes. And so. It may be that there are three or four really key drives in, in the disease that we can actually start to target in a, mm -hmm. maybe a molecular stroke, uh, phen or bio biology-driven phenotype, essentially. Yeah. Well, probably one of the most important things that's happened in the field is to think, is the, the fact that we're now thinking beyond androgens and, and, and the role of androgens. Well, they're clearly the, the most important thing therapeutically at this point in understanding the disease, but still there's there's a lot of biology that is undiscovered here it's somewhat similar to breast cancer but the fact that you the, the responses are so uniform initially to androgens has sort of put us to sleep scientifically but i think that your work and, and the work that we've heard about here uh, uh, with the cytokines is certainly uh, revealing what about one other question that occurred to me during the presentations is what you know, it seems that this radionuclide therapy has real potential in the sense that it's non-toxic, it's relatively easy to use, and um, you, know, you, were, you were cautious about saying it could be used in early disease, but could it be used in patients uh, who are, are uh, on their first hormonal therapy, for example? I, th I think that one limitation is that you are, at least the way that drugs are used at the moment, with the depending on bone turnover to attract yeah. the isotope, I think you need to have some activity in the bone, but I think at the same time, I think the possibility of labeling those drugs with something a little bit more targeted. But yeah. I think probably in the current formulation, it requires some activity in the bone. That's, to a, that's an interesting point. So, you know, using it together simultaneously may not be the way to do it. But I do think to cure more patients, adjuvant therapy will be key. And I presume that for, you know, alpha radin and these drugs, osteoblastic reaction mm -hmm. in the bone is key. So the question is how early? Yeah you know, in that micrometastasis, is the osteoblastic reaction, you know, there? Because actually, if you go in, in early stage patients, has anybody actually looked at imaging, you know, patients who are, you know, say, at the earliest setting, high-risk patients, to see if the alpha radin actually goes into any, in the bone in any way? No, not really, but I mean, we have the data from MR showing, you know, that there, that there, there is a lot of activity right. in the bone long before the bone scan is positive. Mm -hmm. But no, I, I don't think anybody's looked specifically at that in early Because stages. actually adjuvant, abiraterone is what I'm really excited about, yeah, so but right. adjuvant actually uh, alpha radin makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Um, well, I, I guess that something like, what, two-thirds of people that have uh, abnormal PSAs but no obvious disease are going to develop bone metastases. Maybe it's even higher than that. What, what we're seeing, actually, and I think that's... But that might be the ideal setting for using the drug rather agreed, than waiting agreed. for voluminous metastases and trying to treat them. And I think, you know, one of the biggest problems we have in, in, in prostate cancer, such as the use of bone scans, I would actually love to replace bone scans with a better imaging modality that truly reflects you know, the activity of the disease. I think bone scans have been widely abused. I think diffusion weighted magnetic resonance imaging and novel PET tracers have to be developed mm -hmm. to replace bone scans because actually all we get with bone scans is a late detection of the presence of bony metastasis. Increased rates of bone turnover. And you cannot really differentiate osteoblastic reaction from, uh, mm -hmm. you know, from disease. And you need quite a lot of disease there in order for that to reaction it. to have taken place. So. And we're, we're actually with diffusion weighted MRI seeing in patients with rising PSA and a normal bone scan. Multiple metastases in some patients, 50 or more meds despite a normal bone scan. One other thing that you mentioned, Joe, that was uh, interesting to me was the fact that because it's relatively non-toxic, the radionuclides could be used with chemotherapy. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, 
You know, we thought the same thing with the PARP inhibitors. It turns out that they, they do uh, accentuate bone marrow toxicity. Do we have much experience with these? This yeah. combination. Well, there's not, there hasn't been much experience today with alpha radin. Although there's a study which has been uh, led by Michael Morris at Sloan Kettering, looking at alpha radin plus docetaxel. Mm -hmm. So six cycles of, of alpha radin along with six, actually just combining with standard docetaxel. So well give, tolerated. Well, so far it's only phase one at the moment. So it's a BC, the BC10 study. Um, but I think th there's no doubt that the. I mean, it's amazing. We, we, we you know, in a, in a trial where you can't tell who's getting placebo. And it was similar yeah. to abiraterone, but you could kind of tell. Yeah. But in this, you really couldn't tell. What is spectacular is that actually normal bone seems to take up minimal alpha radin. Yeah. Your, your yeah. scans are right. absolutely spectacular. Yeah. Is that really, I mean, bona fide that there's very little uptake in normal bone? Well, the only people that have really done the micro dissymmetry has been Glenn Flux at the Marathon, actually. And they have seen huge activity near the metastases, and mm -hmm. really it falls off very rapidly. So it's truly selective, which is, yeah. you know... Well, maybe it just ref represents the fact that there's a little, much less bone turnover in, mm -hmm. on, sure. on non-metastatic sites. Yeah. So uh, you would expect it. The PARP inhibitor yeah. combinations, and I've done a lot of PARP work, mm -hmm. make a lot of sense yeah. in that setting. Mm -hmm. Although I think the right scheduling of the PARP inhibitor will be yeah. key, yeah. because actually the problem with platinum combinations, and we've done these studies now in phase one setting, is actually if you give the PARP inhibitor continuously, if it's an active PARP inhibitor, you know, it's not to tolerable with full dose chemo. But actually, yeah. if you give the PARP inhibitor in a shorter schedule, it will intermittently it'll be For truly example, with work. Something. Yeah. Now, is it clear that PARP take, uh, plays a role in the repair of uh, DNA damage related to the Double radiation? strand breaks. For sure. For sure. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's ionizing radiation. It's double strand breaks. I think it's, it's pretty clear. Really? Yeah. yeah. Gee, that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. It's a slam dunk. We got it. Where is our. We pitched this to a few pharma companies, but they're, they're nervous of the combination. Actually. Oh, they're, they're nervous about everything. <laughs> we just got to do it. We're working <laughs> we got to try it. Yeah. Well, so it, it's promising. Now, let's take some questions from the audience. Yes, Dr. Bertino. Seems like we have a problem. We have <clears throat> five or six different therapeutic modalities. We must have a similar number of mouse models. How are we going to make rapid progress without treating patients, you know, with two drugs, three drugs, four drugs? It's going to take forever to really find out the best way to uh, treat a patient with prostate cancer. Is, is there an avenue that's going to be better? Uh, is there going to be a, a mouse model where you use tumor from the individual patient to, to, to decide the best way to treatment? What are your thoughts about that? So maybe I can comment on that first. Um, what is interesting to me, and through my work in San Antonio with Eric Rowinski and Tony Tulcher, there are a lot of tumor binding drug work and mitotic kinase targeting work, is that I believe the taxanes work in prostate cancer primarily to targeting androgen receptor signaling. Now, I cannot prove that quite yet, but there is strong evidence preclinically that the taxanes work in prostate cancer cell lines that are AR positive, but not AR negative, i.e. PC3. We have tested a number of mitotic kinase inhibitors in patients and seen no activity. PLK inhibitors, aurora kinase inhibitors, I can go on, KSB. So increasingly, I am convinced, actually, these drugs are not working, working through targeting mitosis. Moreover, we have data we're just submitting uh, in a manuscript that all the patients that are refractory to abiraterone, when they progress to the taxane docetaxel, are refractory to docetaxel. We know that we've published data already that abiraterone is much more active post-docetaxel, much more active, sorry, pre-docetaxel than post-docetaxel. Mm -hmm. So there is genuine cross-resistance between the taxanes and abiraterone. I believe what is going to emerge is that actually the taxanes are increasingly likely to be AR targeting drugs, and we'll be able to identify who will benefit from the taxanes by looking at whether they've had benefit from abiraterone or vice versa. Now, what that means is there may be a subgroup of patients that just do badly on well, AR targeting drugs, and that's probably about 20% of patients in, in our practice, in our trials so far. And that may give us some, so, some leverage. So that raises an interesting question. Is the molecular profile, the gene array profile that you do on a patient after failure on, on a taxane or refractoriness to taxane, the same as after a, uh, androgen inhibition? 
energy deprivation. So we're doing that work now. Obviously, it's very hard to do mRNA studies. We're doing multicolor fish studies. Um, certainly, erg rearrangement alone does not help you by fish. So we, we have that data, although the, the patient numbers are not large. But um, it, I guess the question is, is there a distinct subset of patients who respond don't respond to androgen receptor, don't respond to, to taxanes, and have this unique uh, from the beginning. So can I, unique. the difficulty for us is that the measure of activity is usually PSA. Yeah. PSA is a pharmacodynamic reader of AR signaling. And the problem is that drugs that cause a PSA fall may not necessarily be having an anti-tumor effect, but the PSA falls because you switch off AR. Yeah, right. So yeah. I think it's, it's a complex thing to evaluate because we don't have true radiological yeah. measures. Right. I think the CDC counts will actually give us some leverage on this, and mm -hmm. that's what we're trying to do mm -hmm. currently. Mm -hmm. So we've actually got a trial that uh, we're, we're protocols almost finished. Where we're going to, it's a randomized phase two trial, we're going to give abiraterone first, then, then um, cabazitaxel, or cabazitaxel first and abiraterone. And we're going to look at um, what the um, response rates are, you know, in first line or second line in those two settings. And we're going to try and pull up biomarkers to, you know, see who, Which where we can predict who responds. Progress in both, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to take Joe's comment, but actually slightly reverse it. Because um, I think you've got a huge opportunity in prostate cancer that's not going to be as easily available in diseases like breast cancer or in colorectal cancer or indeed even lung cancer now, where those adjuvant therapies and indeed metastatic disease therapy combinations are much, much better established. Mm. So the question I would be posing uh, to all of you is, is there such a thing as standard of care today in prostate? Is that not your opportunity? In other words, go back and really characterize a disease yeah, properly. Right. Uh, much as in the last slide, as you, you know, we're finishing, Johan, uh, and sort of begin to propose hypotheses now that you do have active agents that go across a spectrum of different types of activity from tubulin binders to DNA damaging agents and start to model those, much as I think Joe was suggesting, uh, to actually look at what's going to interact. Because I could hypothesize, Johan, in relationship to taxanes, that it's just a pump problem. You've actually just upgraded the pump and apparatus not getting in, or it's not staying in. You know, so I, I think there's a real opportunity in prostate because of where you're at in the evolution of treatment. Um, I just I don't know if you agree with that or disagree. I suppose the big opportunity I see for abiraterone, um is in the adjuvant setting. Mm. It's got to be. Yeah. Um, because well, it, it, particularly you you pointed out there, you can in the CTC work you can identify patients who are going to do badly, even before they have obvious metastatic disease. They're rising the, uh, CTC counts and probably rising PSAs. And do we have to wait until they have metastatic disease? Can we intervene at that point? So we have just included a breathron in our UK stampede trial, which is a huge 5,000 patient trial, where we're giving a breathron upfront with castration at diagnosis to high-risk patients and patients who are diagnosed with metastatic disease at the onset. It's a very complex trial, but essentially that trial, I hope, will prove that a breast mm -hmm. can improve survival from first-line setting. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, I agree with you entirely, um, you know, Patty. The opportunities are huge. Yeah. And I think the advantage of a breast cancer is that actually in breast cancer, there is a mindset of continuing to give drugs that are essentially inactive. <laughs> in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth line setting with chemotherapy. That mindset does not actually exist in prostate cancer. Yeah. So we have a genuine ability to actually make major changes in the disease. Yeah. And there's a huge number of exciting new drugs that we're testing. Maybe, Patty, can I just address that from the perspective of the scientific side? There's a sparsity of relevant models available for preclinical work. Mm. And I think the opportunity to develop, you know, advanced preclinical models around genetic modeling much as what we've heard from Dave Tubis and I know in Samson at this meeting, I think that is a massive opportunity in prostate cancer. And I really, when we only get that type of cell line and genetic model uh, sort of across the spectrum of the molecular stratification we see on that slide, well, only then will we be able to start to model it all the way into patient. David, I wanted to ask you a question what, during your presentation. There must be monoclonal <laughs> antibodies to uh, IL-8 into mm. to its receptor. Yes. So why aren't they available to, to do therapeutic studies? So uh, Abgenix did have an antibody that was directed against IL-8. I think that was um, 
has been taken up by one of the bio of, Am of I think it's Amgen was it took it on. Um, it was trialed, as I believe, by uh, Manasha Barelli uh, in a trial in melanoma. Um, right. But I never find the uh, sort of the outcome of that. I don't think it, the trial was open very long. I think uh, one of the things that Johan and, uh, and I will probably agree on is the redundancy in the chemokine system makes it very difficult to argue about targeting the ligand in particular because yeah. what you're going to leave yourself open to is the other chemokines that can activate the receptor. Mm. So an anti-IL-8 so antibody is not going to take out multiple ligands for each receptor. Redundancy. Oh, I see. So one of the things that I would be arguing for yeah, is that probably receptor. a receptor-directed right. strategy right. Um, is, is probably the key way to go with chemokines. And in that regard, I think we still have a lot to learn about certainly in the system that I'm looking at, whether it's really a CXCR2 driven phenomena or CXCR1. And again, it's really only when we get the preclinical information and actually challenge those yeah. models with those agents will we actually understand that's, that, right. that biology. Okay, we had other questions. Yes, Richard. Uh, just to revisit the market story Obviously, it's been alluded to quite a lot in this conference about the single agent lethality and P10, Chris did a nice presentation showing the P10 synthetic lethality with PARP inhibitors, which suggests you don't have homologous recombination. And yet, the, da the data you've shown, Dave, and also what I understood in the past was that P10 mutant tumors were really resistant. That, that seems to be a real disconnect there, uh, if you've lost repair. And actually, is there any plan to try the PARP inhibitors as single agents in prostate cancer? So we've treated about 25 CRPC patients with uh, PARP inhibitors. As you know, and Andrew said earlier, we are starting a trial very soon, just going to ethics, called 2PARP, which is an investigative initiated adaptive design trial, which um, is studying Olaparib in CRPC. We are seeing some activity um, in the disease, a single agent. Chris is not in the audience, so I can uh, say so this. Is and it? it's not in Chris, the... Chris Lord. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I guess. Um, the P10 story is complex, but there is some evidence that P10 regulates Strat51 um, expression. Um, we, I don't think we fully understand how P10 impacts double-strand DNA repair, but I do think there is significant evidence, and I wrote an editorial in Cancer Cell in May supporting this, that actually in prostate cancer there may be DNA repair defects, and certainly Arulchinian's data suggests that PARP is involved in ERG transcriptional activity and there's some evidence that PARP is also involved in AR transcriptional you know, activity. Maybe even PARP is key to ERG and AR transcriptional activity. So I think there is very strong evidence for, targeting, for studying PARP inhibitors as single agents in advanced prostate cancer, maybe even more in combination. Johan, isn't there a predisposition to prostate cancer in males who are heterozygous for BRCA? Thank you for reminding me. So we have published in the England Journal of Medicine, and I think we have three patients now in my practice with BRCA2 carrier Protection. advanced prostate cancer with spectacular responses to PARP inhibition single agents. But those are rare patients, much rarer yeah. than the BRCA1 breast and ovary. Well, the, the, the possibility exists that there's brca just like with ovarian cancer. I'm too. sure there is. In fact, there's published data that there are mutations um, in sporadic prostate cancers yes. of genes um, like CHECK2, I think at least 8% of sporadic prostate cancers yeah. and of BRCA1 in sporadic prostate cancer. So I think, you know, we're excited about this. That's an interesting so. possibility. Yes. I wanted to come, to come back to something you said about um, us, under, you know, not looking at the androgen treatment, the androgen ablation therapy that's been done because it works quite well. Because we've been doing some work with bicalutamide and looking at the effects that it has on the microenvironment immediately after treatment and it's very clear that you, initially you get a very significant drop in the um, oxygen levels in the tumours. Now we're starting at a relatively low oxygen level anyway of about 0.8% oxygen so these tumours are very mm. sort of hypoxia resistant anyway but they go to down to below 0.1 for about a fortnight and then they start they revascularize and they climb again so you get a, an angiogenic burst which doing some work with David has shown that it's probably IL-8 dependent rather than VEGF dependent. So there's, this is a model system that I think is actually really useful. I think it's also important that we understand that this is happening in patients. There is evidence from um, Peter Hoskin and Roberto Alonzi using bold MRI 
that um, the oxygen level does drop mm -hmm. in, in patients that are treated with bicalutamide, but then they gave Zolodex, and we are planning to do that experiment to see they kept the oxygen levels low, or at least the blood flow levels as they were measuring. So it, to me, it suggests that we need to be very careful that this isn't exactly what's driving the malignant progression. In our tumours, within a month, the mice have got lung mets, which are much more significant than if you don't treat them or if you give them a drug that kills the hypoxic cells. So I think we've got a, a, a handle here on what's going on. We could do two nice experiments. One, we could do microarrays right across that 28 days to look at molecular changes. We have done some PCR array work, and clearly there are going to be changes because the oxygen levels drop so much. Obviously, various things happen then, and the, the vasculature changes as well. We've got pictures of the vasculature changing. But we can also then think about molecular targeting agents. I mean, I've come in from this because I was working on a bioreductive drug, but clearly there are molecular targeting agents out there already that we might want to give. There's lots of different drugs there that could be given with bicalutamide and other androgen ablation therapies at that early time point that isn't really done at the moment. Although, Johan, you just said about um, using apiraterone in, with the uh, LHRA uh, antagonist, so maybe this is a good reason for doing it. But it would be quite nice to look at it in the model system as well to see if you're actually targeting the things that you want to target. Mm. Comments? Uh, yeah. I think hypoxia is a key issue. In fact, Ian Tanner gives this wonderful lecture, uh, particularly on drug delivery uh, in, <coughs> in disease, in metastatic cancer, uh, raising concern that actually very often drug is not being delivered to a lot of patients, you know, tumor. So hypoxia is a huge issue. Um, and um, it's a huge issue for radiation as well as, you know, systemic therapy. Um, there's been a lot of work studying hypoxia in patients. It's definitely there. Um, I think the bioreductive drug area has been disappointing overall for us, really, in the field. Um, but we need to get a better handle on it. I mean, Joe, you may, maybe can comment yeah, on I that. I think um, you were saying about hypoxia. Yes, you're right. I mean, if, if you're getting this collapse in the oxygen levels and vasculature is collapsing, that's the reason for the, uh, the drop in the oxygen levels, then you need to be careful when you give anything you're going to combine with an androgen ablation. Uh, treatment because you might maybe give it, you know, 12 hours before or something like that, or a few hours before, because your your the vascular collapses very quickly. Uh, yeah. You know, I think the radiation I mean, therapy comes in later, so it's not so yeah. much of a problem. I mean, so I mean, would you like to? Yeah. yeah well, I think I, against that is the the huge body of randomised trial evidence showing that hormone therapy given before, during, and after radiation improves survival mm -hmm. dramatically. Sure. I mean, we're talking yeah. 15, 20 percent difference mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm in survival and even short course hormone therapy both with bicalutamide or with uh, androgen suppression therapy uh, certainly enhance the benefits from radiation therapy so obviously there's a lot, lot of process going on it's well established that the hypoxia story with neoadjuvant hormone therapy I think when Chris Parker was in Toronto he had some Eppendorf probe data from, from patients who were having neoadjuvant bicalutamide there's no doubt there's hypoxia there but the, there's also no doubt that the hormone therapy adds hugely to the benefits from radiation yeah, ultimately. Well, I think that this speaker raises an interesting point, though. If, if you block the hypoxia response, you might get additional benefits, and we really haven't done a good job of, of finding drugs to do that. But people are working on it. You know, the, the, the disease which is stimulating this is renal cancer because of the involvement of, of uh, HIF-1-alpha and, and uh, the, the angiogenic, uh, brisk angiogenesis that goes on there. People are actually looking at inhibitors of HIF-1-alpha now, HIF-2-alpha, actually. So uh, that, that's an interesting thing. Another comment about that is that we don't really have a lot of information about the interaction of, of uh, many of the targeted drugs with radiation. And I think there are several large projects starting now to look at this experimentally to see whether it makes sense to use receptor inhibitors with radiation. What it, does it blunt the response? Does it accentuate the response? You, you brought up these issues uh, earlier, and uh, we just don't know a lot about it, but it's a, a serious possibility. One, one final thing I'd like to bring up is the, the we've heard earlier from the, from, from the breast cancer people how uh, an mTOR inhibitor has been remarkably successful in this, this trial that's uh, that uh, Gabe Hordabaji described in, in uh, 
hormone or recept or hormone refractory patients with breast cancer. Has has the mTOR uh, inhibitory story been explored in, in uh, prostate cancer in, in androgen receptor or androgen deprivation resistant patients? So Charles Sawyer's pursued work many years ago now when he was at UCLA looking at uh, rapalogs in advanced prostate cancer and also in the, in the early stage setting. But there was clear evidence that there was um, feedback loops involved um, and that um, torque too may be really important in, right. in that setting. Right. We now know there's really incontrovertible evidence that there is a yin-yang AR-AKT interaction and um, actually Charles and his group published a paper in Cancer Cell in May, Carver et al, showing that actually if you have um, um, high AKT activity, you have low AR, and if you have low AKT activity, you have high AR. Um, and um, we have clinical evidence to support that. We've tested MK206, a very potent AKT inhibitor, as a single agent with castration uh, in castrated patients and show no tumor activity, but on withdrawing the AKT inhibitor, we've seen withdrawal responses in multiple patients, sometimes on even a thousand fold falls on PSA. And I am- How do you explain that? I am convinced that actually, as Charles has shown in his elegant laboratory work, that actually if you remove the AKT blockade, then AKT rises. It, there's this yin yang, AR expression falls and therefore PSA falls. So in we are some way it down regulates AR. Yeah, it's feedback loops. So okay. we are now actually just starting randomized uh, phase two studies where we're giving abiraterone with an AKT inhibitor or a PI3K TOR inhibitor. But I think what this implies is that there is a real danger to give in TOR, AKT, PI3K inhibitors as single agents mm -hmm. to prostate cancer patients because actually they will upregulate AR signaling and tumor growth. And I guess this is a really key issue. Um, I, the other thing I guess that, that needs to be done is to do these studies in the selected subsets of patients, the ones that have P10 loss, P10 loss or the uh, PI3 kinase mutations. So I was just gonna get onto that. All that yeah. data was in P10 loss cancers. It was. Um, so that, that is key. So these studies will look at P10 as a predictive biomarker of response. Okay. Are there any other questions? I think we probably reached the end of the session. Patty, one last question. Um, just one other question I had. I'm intrigued by the alpha particle, da both data that looks like it's coming out, but also mechanism of action. I mean, it's uh, a very low emitter, as I understand it. And so the question I have, Joe, is, um, is this an anti-tumor effect, or is there something going on in terms of the tumor microenvironment? Because the two don't seem to fit together in terms of the size of the clinical effect that you're getting with something that has such a low penetrance? Yeah, I mean, it has low penetrance, but what it does penetrate, it kills everything in sight. So it's, it's very, very high LET radiation. So essentially, it doesn't matter whether the cell is hypoxic or not. If, that, if, if, it's, if it's in the radius of, of, of radiation, it, it will, the cell will not survive that. So I think it certainly there's an anti-tumor effect. There's no doubt about that because we certainly see PSA responses. There are radiological responses as well. But I think you're right. I think it's more than, it's more than that because when you look at the di distribution of dose in the bone, it, it can't all be explained by, radi by ionizing radiation hitting tumor. I think there, there, there may be a bystander effect. I think pretty Is certainly there's a bystander effect. Perhaps affecting um, uh, angiogenesis and blood vessels. And yeah, and, it, and it, may, it may directly affect the, the, the sort of the balance within the bone itself, the osteoblastic, mm -hmm. osteoclastic mm -hmm. um, balance. So I think there, there's, there's certainly effects beyond the direct tumor effect, but there's no doubt there is a direct tumor effect. I, mean, I think it would also be worth looking at whether the patients that respond most have some underlying DNA repair yeah. defect, yeah. you know, homologous formation DNA repair point. defect, yes. because that may explain why they are so super sensitive to these agents. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank our speakers and our, the supporters of this, uh, this session. It's been very interesting, and it's remarkable how this field has progressed so much. And you folks here have deserved great credit for, for the, all that we've heard about. Thank you.